Well, hey, welcome back to the studio. You know, in the late 1980s, Sony unveiled a groundbreaking innovation, and it promised to redefine how we recorded and listened to music, even at home. It was the digital audio tape, or DAT. It was compact, it was cutting edge, and it was capable of studio quality sound, even at home. Now, it seemed destined to succeed, but what stopped it from becoming a household staple? Join me today as I unravel the history of Sony DAT tape, its groundbreaking technology, and the challenges that sealed its fate. The idea for digital audio tape emerged during the digital revolution of the 1980s. Now, Sony, and they were one of the pioneers of consumer electronics, they sought to create a format that combined the convenience of cassette tapes with the superior sound quality of compact discs. Now, analog tapes were the dominant medium for home recording and playback, but they were prone to wear, noise interference, and sound degradation over time. Digital technology, on the other hand, offered the promise of flawless audio replication. Now, I remember when DAT was popular, well at the peak of its popularity, and I really wanted a DAT deck. I was using analog tape every day and listening to vinyl records. The thought of recording digitally was magical to me, and I had a CD player. I loved it, but I couldn't record. Well, Sony and their partner Philips had already co-developed the compact disc, and CDs offered high-quality playback, but at that time, they weren't designed for home recording. DAT, which was introduced in 1987, aimed to fill that gap. It used helical scan recording, which was similar to VCRs of the day, which enabled it to store digital audio on a tiny magnetic tape. The result? a compact cassette measuring just 73 by 54 millimeters that could hold up to two hours of CD quality audio. Now, DAT wasn't just a tape, it was a format designed to adapt to multiple use cases. It supported three sampling rates, 32 kilohertz for long duration recordings, 44.1 kilohertz to match CD quality, and 48 kilohertz for professional grade recordings. Now, it had a dynamic range exceeding 90 decibels, and the wow and flutter was negligible. DAT promised a leap forward in audio fidelity. Now, Sony released its first DAT machines, the DTC-1000 and PCM-2000, with much fanfare. But these early models came with a steep price tag, over $1,500 in 1987. Now, for many consumers, this was a luxury few could afford, but Sony was betting on the format's quality to justify its cost. While the consumer market was slow to embrace DAT, professionals in the audio and broadcasting industry saw its potential immediately. Recording studios adopted DAT as a reliable medium for mastering albums, and with its ability to produce bit-for-bit -bit accurate copies of audio, it became the standard for sending final mixes to pressing plants. Now, musicians and producers praised DAT for its portability and sound quality. And unlike bulky reel-to-reel -reel machines, DAT decks were compact and easy to transport. This allowed artists to carry masters with them or record live performances on the go without sacrificing quality. DAT also became indispensable in the film and television industries. Portable DAT recorders like the Sony TCD D3 enabled sound engineers to capture high-quality location audio during film shoots. The format's durability and ability to retain audio integrity over multiple playbacks made it an ideal choice for archiving sound effects, dialogue, and music scores. For live performances, DAT provided a reliable way to record shows in real time without the risk of distortion or degradation, a challenge with analog equipment. And iconic tours and concerts from the late 80s and 90s owe their preserved sound to DAT technology. Now, despite its success in professional circles, Sony wanted DAT to succeed as a consumer product. However, there was one major obstacle, copyright. Now, record labels and the music industry feared that DAT's ability to create perfect digital copies of CDs and vinyl records would lead to widespread piracy. Now, unlike analog copies, which degrade slightly with each duplication, DAT allowed the infinite, identical copies of digital audio, and this posed a direct threat to the profitability of recorded music. The industry's fears weren't unfounded. I mean, consumers could theoretically use DAT to duplicate entire music libraries without any loss in quality.
Now, the debate reached a climax in the late 1980s. Record labels lobbied government to regulate DAT technology, leading to the introduction of the Audio Home Recording Act in 1992. Now, this law mandated that all consumer DAT machines include SCMS, a copy protection system that limited digital duplication. SCMS restricted consumers from making second-generation digital copies, which frustrated potential buyers. Now, combined with high prices, both for the machines and tapes, DAT became a hard sell for the average listener. For a format designed to replace the cassette, these limitations were a major setback. DAT wasn't just competing with analog cassettes. It faced a rapidly evolving landscape of digital formats. Compact discs had already established themselves as the dominant playback medium, and CDs were more affordable, easier to use, and widely supported by record labels and manufacturers. In the mid-90s, Sony introduced the Minidisc as an alternative to DAT, and Minidisc offered many of the same benefits like digital audio and editing capabilities, but it was more compact and user-friendly. It quickly overshadowed DAT as Sony's primary focus for consumer recording. The final blow to DAT came with the rise of hard drive-based recording in the MP3 format. Now, devices like portable digital audio recorders and computer-based recording software offered the same quality and features as DAT without the need for tapes. And by the early 2000s, DAT machines were phased out of production and the format slipped into obscurity. Though the era of DAT was brief, its legacy endures in surprising ways. This small cassette once symbolized the cutting edge of audio technology, a glimpse into a future where sound could be captured, stored and reproduced with breathtaking precision. For professionals, DAT was more than a tool. It was a revolution. Albums were mastered on it, live performances preserved, and moments of creative brilliance immortalized. And today, many of those recordings remain untouched by time, a testament to the format's durability and fidelity. In the world of enthusiasts and archivists, DAT holds a special place. It's a bridge to an era when innovation and ambition drove audio to new heights. And for some, it's not just technology, it's a treasure trove of memories. While DAT may have failed as a consumer product, its influence is woven into the DNA of modern audio. From the precision of digital mastering to the convenience of portable recorders, DAT laid the groundwork for the tools we use today. Now, its story reminds us that even innovations ahead of their time can falter under the weight of competing interests, market forces, and shifting technology. To some, DAT is a relic. To others, it's a forgotten gem. But one thing is certain. It was a bold step towards the future of sound, a format that dared to dream big and, in its own way, changed the world of audio forever. So, in an age of retro enthusiasm, why don't I think DAT will make a comeback? Well, I don't think there's the charm with the format. With the cassette and vinyl resurgence, it's a digital generation discovering an analog format. The quality of DAT doesn't really depend on the equipment. It is what it is, so it's easy to find other digital mediums if that's what you're looking for. CDs have great album art, sometimes as good as a vinyl record. I also don't think there were enough albums released on DAT to create a collector market. In addition, why would someone want to record on DAT in the modern age? You can record better quality digital audio on your hard drive. Now, I think the combination of the lack of charm and better alternatives are what will keep DAT from making a comeback. And you know what? I'm okay with that. I'd rather listen to an analog recording anyway. And when I want digital, I want even higher quality. Now, for that reason, I'm not going to go and do a side-by-side -side audio comparison between this and a reel reel or a cassette or anything like that. We all know what digital audio sounds like. But I will give you a tour of this deck, my Sony DTC-670. It's a prosumer deck from the 90s. And you know what? It's pretty neat. It's pretty full-featured. So let's take a look at this one. So first thing, we'll take a look at the front of this unit just to kind of give you an idea of the features that DAT gives you. Now, DAT is a uh, tape-based format, so you do have pretty cool loading and eject mechanism here. The thing that I do like about this deck is that you can see the tape inside. I just have a thing for watching the tapes go round and round. But when, when it loads, it loads kind of like a VCR does. It pulls the tape out, gets it queued up and ready to play or record. Now, this one does offer timer recording if you have that. This one goes between standard record mode, 44.1, and long play. Uh, on the front, you do have your standard transport controls. 
recording controls. One of the nice things about DAT tape is you can record and set IDs, track IDs for each individual track. So you can do easy track skip. It'll keep track of where your recordings are. Uh, it does have analog op and optical and coaxial digital inputs, balance control, manual recording level, headphone output. So it works basically like a regular compact cassette deck, except it's digital and you can record IDs onto the tape. It is a, a, a pretty nice unit. I do like this one. It fits with the aesthetic of the other Sony cassette decks that I have. But, you know, it's a pretty basic deck. It doesn't have a lot of the professional features that you'd see on some of the nicer decks. But this one was made for the consumer market. Now, if we want to record some audio, all we have to do is set our record level, hit record, it records it, then you play it back like a normal tape. There's really nothing remarkable about how one of these works. It's just the fact that it records digitally, so it's pretty cool. I'm going to see if we can get a shot of the mechanism in here so you can see what I'm talking about with the helical scan. With the cover off, it's a little bit easier to see the mechanism. The actual transport mechanism is all one unit here, modular, so you can take it out and replace it or repair it. But when we load a tape, you can see it pulls the tape in to the spinning head, and when we hit play, it's basically like a VCR transport. Pulls the tape across the head for uh, the digital recording. Of course, this one isn't recording video, it's recording audio. So, that's how a DAT deck works in a very simplified fashion. Now, if you enjoyed this look back at the story of Sony DAT, please be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell for more dives into history of audio, video, and computer tech. Let me know what you think of my thoughts about DAT. Do you agree? Disagree? Let me know in the comments. Until next time, happy listening and keep exploring.